the Western Seminar series of talks, and today we have with us Nicolas and Tidwar, and he's going to talk about the station solution of the optical gravitation therapies around black holes. And then, whenever you want. Okay. Thank you, Timo, and thank you everyone for, for coming here. Uh, I am uh, Nicolas Santiswal. I am a PhD student uh, at the Departamento de Astronomía y Astrofísica. And I'm going to present my work, which title is Quasi Stationary Solution of Self Gravitative scalar fields around black hole. This work has been done in collaboration with uh, Juan Carlos de Goyado, Pedro Montero, and Tony Ford. So, uh, numerical relativity is a field of research of general relativity devoted to seek for solution of the instant equations through uh, computer simulations. It has been a field of uh, intense activity and considerable progress has been made over the last decade. With the increase of the, po of, of the computational power, uh, supercomputers have become uh, virtual laboratories where we can test theoretical problems that cannot be solved analytically and explain some astrophysical observational data. One of the major achievements of numerical relativity has been the, the, the accur accurate and stable simulation of a merger of two black holes and the computation of the gravitational waveform emitted by such a, such a system. One of the major goals of, of the main goals of numerical relativity is also extract this gravitational waveform uh, to, the, to help the detection uh, of gravitational waveforms by the second generation of the gravitational wave So well, uh, the Einstein equations describes the space-time dynamics. They relate the space-time uh, geometry with the content of matter and energy. However, few analytic solutions uh, with astrophysical significance are known and only when adopting simplifying symmetries. So we have, for example, the Schwarzschild space-time, which corresponds to a spherical symmetric black hole, the Kerr space-time, which is a rotating uh, black hole with symmetry, and cosmological solution. But if we want to study more complex and interesting uh, systems that cannot be solved analytically, we have to try to solve the uh, field equations using numerical uh, techniques and complex computational uh, codes with supercomputers. So in order to have the evolution in time of a, any physical system, we have to formulate this, this problem as a, a initial value for Cauchy problem, which is given an adequate initial data and boundary conditions, the fundamental equations will um, must predict the evolution in time of, of the system. However, as you know, the Einstein equations are written in such a way that the space and time are treated on equal footing. This covariance is very, is, is very important and quite elegant in, in, theoretical, uh, in a theoretical point of view, but uh, we cannot think clearly about an evolution in time of the gravitational field. So, in order to uh, formula to rewrite the Einstein equations as a Cauchy problem, we have to split space and time in a clean way. So the formulation of GR that results from this splitting is known as the 3 plus 1 formalism, which is a foliation of the four-dimensional space-time with three-dimensional spatial hypersurfaces defined by a scalar uh, function which is the temporal coordinate time. If we consider two uh, hypersurfaces, the space time contained between both of them can be determined from these function, functions. The three dimensional spatial metric, which measures the proper distance between, uh, within the hypersurfaces itself, 
the lapse uh, of proper time that uh, between two hypersurfaces measure, me measured by uh, observers moving along the normal direction to the hypersurfaces and the shift vector which relates uh, the spatial coordinates uh, uh, between two adjacent hypersurfaces. So we have the metric of the space time written as a function of the lab, the, the labs, the shift and the three dimensional spatial metric. We can introduce the unit normal vector to the spatial hypersurfaces. So we can define and introduce a metric from the four dimensional uh, metric and also the extrinsic curvature which is geometrically the change of the unit normal vector when it is parallel transported from one point to another in an, an hypersurfaces. So if we, we speed uh, space and time in, in, from this way, the Einstein equation end up, uh, end up in, in two sets of equations. The first set it corresponds to the evolution equations of the extrinsic curvature tensor and the three dimensional spatial metric. If we solve this equation, we will have the evolution in time of the system. But also we have the constraint equations, namely the Hamiltonian and the momentum equ equations. That, uh, at the continuum level, they, they are satisfied at each time slice. But if we are only solving the evolution equations, the numerical error will violate this, this constraint. However, this, this numerical error should converge away with, with the solution. So, but this is not the final step because the DM system is really hyperbolic, meaning that it's not well suited for numerical simulation because numerical instabilities may appear with time, grow, and eventually destroy our, our solution. So, we can modify the original IDM system by introducing new evolution variables such as the conformal factor, the conformal free metric, and a conformal stressless extrinsic curvature, for example, in order to make our system strongly hyperbolic. And this results in the BSSM formulation, which stands for Vanguard, Shapiro, Shibata, Nakamura, which is one of the most widely used uh, of the standard uh, formulation in, in numerical relativity. I have to mention that there are others, other formulations that, for example, solve also the, the constant equations and perform a constrained evolution. But also we have the, in particular, the set of formulation, which is very similar to BSSN, but uh, it, it achieves a, a reduction of several orders of, a, of the Hamiltonian constant violation with respect to BSSN. We have worked a little bit with this formulation, so what? Want to, to mention it. So here I show the, the, the set of evolution equations that we are going to solve for for now for uh, half the, the dynamics in time of our space time. This the evolution equation of the PSSM formulation in spherical coordinates and under the assumption of, of spherical symmetry. Uh, I show also the constraint equations. But we are only going to compute it to uh, monitorize the accuracy of our solution. So, um, our code is a one dimensional code that uses uh, spherical coordinates. Few codes uses, use uh, spherical coordinates and under the assumption of spherical uh, symmetry. So, for many Astrophysical phenomena, the spherical coordinates are well adapt better to their geometry, for example, for gravitational collapse. However, uh, for curvilinear uh, coordinates, there are singularities associated to the coordinates, like terms that behave like one over r near the origin, that are source of numerical problems. But recently, a uh, big <coughs> metal has have been proposed and applied successfully. Big method uh, stands for partially implicit conjunctura method that 
can handle these, these singularities, so we can perform uh, the, the, the evolution with spherical coordinates. So we have a code that is able to, to solve the evolution equation for the for the Einstein equations. So we can know the dynamics of our space time. And now we are going to put to add a, to this space time and a scalar field. Distribution. And why? Why is that? Why would, do you do we want to study an scalar field uh, in a general relativistic uh, space time? Because scalar field uh, play an important role in many areas of theoretical physics. In uh, cosmological context, context, scalar fields have been proposed as constituents of dark matter halos in galaxy. Galaxy. So this is. This scalar field dark matter model is an alternative to the standard CDN model. But of course, there, there is large observational evidence that points out to the present presence of supermassive black holes at the center of each galaxy. So we want to, to study the behavior of the, of the scalar field uh, near a black hole. And to consider scalar fields as plausible candidates for dark matter, this scalar field uh, must survive for cosmological time scales in the presence of this uh, black hole. So the, the black hole cannot absorb this, this scalar field in, in a short time and cannot just escape to the infinity. Several studies in the linear reset uh, regime where the, the space-time metric is keep, uh, keep, kept uh, fixed have shown that uh, there is a potential well due to the mass term for massive scalar fields that uh, give rise to two types of modes that are possible depending on the boundary condition. One is the, the non-normalizable quasi-normal modes and the other one is the quasi-bounce states. We are going to study these quasi-bounce states which decay at infinity and are localized around the, the black hole. Uh, so these are known as highly black hole solution because we have a scalar field configuration around black holes that are kind of a cloud of scalar field. That and more importantly, that this quasi bound state might may be very long lived. So the problem of if we can have this scalar field for time uh, cos cosmological time scales seems to be uh, so. So clouds of scalar field surrounding black holes are called uh, highly weak, because you know the, the Noether theorem that states that black holes are only characterized by like, the, the mass, the angular momentum and the charge, so they are called kind of weak. So in this picture I show a supermassive Black hole is a picture from the, the interstellar movie. And if our results are correct, so this, in fact, this supermassive black hole should be a, a week. Okay. Uh, the frequency of the quasi bound states for very small values of the scalar field mass, consider, uh, compatible with dark matter models, are very, very very uh, small, so it's really a light scalar field. And this is for the frequency, of the order of 10 to minus 6. And in physical units, the mass of this scalar field should be of the order of 10 to minus 24 uh, units of the uh, Planck constant. So it's really a light scalar field, but uh, there are a uh, Candidate, it's the action. The action, it's a, pa a boson that has been postulated to, to solve the, the CP's symmetry conservation, I believe. I'm not really an expert, so. Um, this action has a very light, very small mass, and seem to be, seems to be of the order of this, of this mass needed for this quasi-bound state. So, 
while the test field approximation is valid as long as the energy of this scalar field is small, so we can keep the, the metric fixed as a background. Uh, this is valid, but what happens when the, the energy of the scalar field is even larger than that of the initial mass of the, of the black hole? We, maybe we, have, we are going to have a breakdown of this test field approximation and we are not going to have this uh, bound state. So, and so to avoid the bad reaction of this color field onto the space-time dynamics will become non-negligible and we need non-linear simulation of self-gravitated uh, scalar field. So, in this work we have evolved this this self-gravitating scalar field uh, environment around uh, black holes, you know, highly dynamical in space. So I, I have shown the evolution equation for the space-time, and now I show the, the building order equation, which, which is governs the, the scalar field evolution. Uh, we use two first order variables to find as capital P and capital C, and we obtain this, this system of first order equation that we are going to solve just as the evolution equation for the space time, for the instant equation. As you can see, the, you can see the, the lapse and the shift to the extrinsic trace of the extrinsic curvature. So if the scalar field is self-gravitating and changes our space time, this uh, change will uh, appear in this evolution equation. And also, uh, the, the, uh, the scalar field will influence the space-time through these matter source terms that are components of the energy stress energy tensor, which appears here in the right-hand side of the, of the equation. So these terms appear on the evolution equation of the of the uh, this equation, so if we have a self gravitating scalar field, this will influence the space time dynamics. Okay, I have said that um, we need a Cauchy problem, so we need an, an adequate initial data, and for that, the initial data should satisfy the constraints. Should. That means that should be a solution of the Einstein equation. So we choose uh, a Gaussian profile distribution for the scalar field initial, which is parameterized with the amplitude, the initial position of the width. And even this non-specific initial uh, distribution of the scalar field will lead to quasi-bound states when interacting with the black hole. So if we take uh, these values for for the auxiliary variables of the scalar field and for the extrinsic curvature equal to zero, the momentum constraint is satisfied in its uh, trivial, but we have to solve the Hamiltonian constraint for the conformal factor, which is this this equation. Uh, we assume that the conformal factor can be written as a, as a sum of the uh, the conformal factor of analytical black hole and a contribution of the, the our of our scalar field. So the Hamiltonian constraint reduced to a equation for this contribution u that we have to solve using a fourth order Runge-Kutta. And so we have an initial data that is solution to the Einstein equation and is adequate for our evolution. So in this work we have evolved uh, stationary black holes with a surrounding scalar field cloud. We have seen that while part of the scalar field is absorbed by the black hole uh, and growing its mass, another part just remains, has a quasi-bound state that oscillates for a long time in the form of quasi-bound state. And is continuously uh, falling scalar field to, into the, the black hole. So we have evolved 25 different models exploring these different 
uh, values of the initial amplitude, so the, the parameter space that we have, the, the amplitude that more or less controls it. The amplitude will determine the energy, the initial energy of the black the, of the scalar field. So if we are in the test field regime, or if we are we have an uh, we have a self gravitating scalar field, the two first value will correspond to the test field regime, and the other one will go beyond that. And different values of the scalar field mass, which you can see that are several orders of magnitude larger than the the physical, the realistic one, because this is due to uh, lack of computational power. We, can, we have to, to evolve this, this system for very long times in order to, to be able to determine with high precision the, the frequencies of oscillation of the scalar field. So with a, with a mass realistic, it's, uh, it's not possible for, for our powerful and supercomputers. And we just fix the initial position of the of the of the Gaussian and the width, and the, the mass of the black hole is initially set to the mean. Okay, so some numbers for the resolution. And as I have said, our final time is about ten to, to ten to four, which is quite a, a long run for even for spherical symmetry. And we put the, the outer boundary far enough so it doesn't affect any reflection of the outer boundary, affects the dynamics in the final region, which is what we have studied. Of course, we perform a an, an convergence test. We found that our code is second order convergence, convergent, because of our peak time evolution scheme in second order. So our our error is just numerical. With resolution, we can decrease it. And here I present our main results. We, these are well 25 models for different uh, values of the of the scalar field mass and different values of the of the initial amplitude of the Gaussian. You can see that we found for every model at least one frequency. At least the fundamental frequency at which the scalar field is oscillating, but even for others, we, we found uh, uh, some overtone modes. We also show the final mass of the black hole. We can see for that for the larger, for the larger uh, amplitude mo uh, models, the final mass is uh, larger than, than initially than one. And I want just to focus on these four models, which goes the mass keep it fixed, is kept fixed, and we increase the, the amplitude, and we see that the initial energy of this scalar field is increasing. So going from the from the test field approximation to a self gravitating scalar field. So what what is this frequency? This frequency is uh, the frequency of oscillation of the scalar field. Uh, corresponding to this quasi bound state. Oh, so this, this is a nos radial oscillation? Or? Radial. Um, what is oscillation? It's the, the scalar field. So it's some spherical symmetric configuration and somehow there is some exactly. frequency. Yeah. Here I show uh, the evolution of the scalar field, which is oscillating. This is extracted from, from an, an observational point from a, at a, a fixed radius. This is for the test field regime. And if we perform a fast Fourier transform, we are able to obtain the power spectrum and to determine the, the oscillation frequencies that are very they agree with uh, the, the frequency obtained from linear SLA studies. So if we increase the amplitude uh, an order of magnitude, 
we are still at the, at the test field approximation. The frequency have changed slightly with respect to the other model. But if we go further, uh, now we are in the we have a scalar field which is self gravitating. And we see that the, our frequency changes and are higher and higher. And even if we go to, a, to a, our larger amplitude, the, the, uh, the frequencies are even that, uh, higher. And of course, the, the final mass of the black hole has, has changed for at least five or six more. It's 1.2 and 2.8. So uh, there is an adiabatic approximation that uh, states that in the limit if a mu is smaller than one, the real part of the frequency of the massive bound states depend on the mass parameter following this, this equation. And well, for our, our models in the test field regime, we found a, a perfect uh, a perfect agreement most perfect agreement with this adiabatic approximation, but when, when, we, went, when we have a, a larger amplitude, this, our frequencies follow a, an opposite trend because they are increasing, they're getting higher when the, when the mass of the scalar field is, is increasing, which is uh, the contrary that predicts this adiabatic approximation. So I found this breakdown of the adiabatic approximation when we have a self gravitating scalar field. And finally, we have uh, compute the space time invariance as a function of the electric and magnetic part of the well tensor to characterize our space time. And we found that um, for, for the test field regime, the the invariants are, are the same than those for uh, a sparse field of, of mass that you expect because the contribution of the scalar field is negligible. But for the models large, of large amplitude, we found that these at large distances, these, uh, in, in, these invariants are superposed to those of a mass of a parcel of a mass uh, larger than the, the final mass of our black hole. So this means that we can have a degeneracy of the, the motion of the test part of the test particle for a for an, an observer at infinity because our space time seems uh, seems to be the same than for a, a vacuum, vacuum uh, sparse black hole of uh, larger mass than the, the sparse uh, black hole that, that we have uh, obtained from this simulation. So to conclude, we have solved the coupled uh, Klein gordon einstein system in a spherical symmetry using spherical coordinates with a field scheme. We have performed a large number of simulations, nonlinear, accurate, and long-term stable simulation, in order to, to study the wide range of parameters that we have from the from the test field regime to the to a self gravitating scalar field in a fully nonlinear regime. And we have performed a, a Fourier transform our numerical data for the scalar field to characterize and, de and determine the distinctive oscillation frequency, meaning that we have proved the existence of quasi-bound states even uh, at the non-linear non regime for a scalar field, a self gravitating scalar field. So such scalar field oscillation, we have important imprints in a number of astrophysical scenarios such as gravitational wave radiation. So, thank you. Now, if you have any questions, you can ask any questions. So, so if 
I understood what you said, you you start with the Gaussian field. Can you go back to that table with the 25 model? So I, I you mentioned it, but so the mass of the black hole increases. That's that's uh, that column there. It's the in the mass of the upper horizon. And the mass of the scalar field is the E zero. Is, a, is the next one. So both of them increase. So. Both. And ADM is the mass of the total. ADM is the mass of the total system. Ah, the total system. The mass of the, oh, the energy, the scalar field is this column. Mm -hmm. But it's the initial mass of the scalar field. Mm -hmm. So increasing, there is a, a type of this. Uh, increasing the amplitude, we will have more more mass, more energy of this scalar field, and part here there's a fraction of the initial mass of the black hole, and this is larger. And part of the of this energy will end up absorbed by by the black hole. And the other part will just oscillate around this this black hole. Is it important that it's a black hole? Why not just the gravitational potential of a star, for example? Well, it is important because this is a model for dark matter. So we expect to have a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. So the scalar field will, will, be, uh, will be oscillating around this, this black hole. So the, the radius that you used was 10 times the Schwarzschild radius? The radius? The initial? Yes, oh, yeah, that was, you, it was 10 M. Yeah. So, I mean, this cloud is what is the characteristic distance. distance from the black hole, because I guess you need dark matter very far from perhaps, the galactic center. Yeah, I don't know exactly the, the distance at which all, you have all, all the scalar field, but this changes with the mass. These are really a, a toy model just to study this interaction between black hole and scalar field. So this is not a realistic model. But uh, if we decrease the mass, this, uh, this region with the scalar field will become larger. So, but this is the 10. This is just has, I mean, the initial distribution is the most unspecific un distribution of scalar field. So you, you just put this uh, Gaussian in the tail, then you have the black hole there at R0. And you, you see that there are parts that just fall into the black hole and form this, this uh, possible state from just this distribution that is not. Uh, It's not specific. But uh, can't you compute like a profile, a radial profile of the distribution of this cloud? Yes, yes. Like an average radius where? You yes. Well, yes, you can because you can see the evolution for each I mean, for each time you will have the the um, the radial distribution of this phi. And if you decrease, you take smaller values of the scalar field mass. Scalar field mass, you see that this distribution, distribution is in fact more, I mean, it's not uh, block eyes very, very close to the, to the black hole and it begins to, to uh, be more distribu distributed around this. But I don't know, I don't have the numbers or like order of magnitude like 10, 100 times the radius, or 1,000, 10 times, 10,000. Uh, maybe 100 times the radius. So you probably need more to explain dark matter away from the galactic center. Of course, but I mean, uh, these, again, these are not like uh, realistic models, so 
we are just trying to extrapolate on these these quasi bound states because even these these quasi bound these frequencies uh, they will not last for uh, time cosmological time scales is for this mass mm -hmm. this kind of field okay but we are only studying at the computational power we have Similar study with fermions? Or? No, no, but it's an interesting question, interesting study that can be performed. But with fermions, uh, I think the options are more complicated than for the bosons. So you mean that? Uh, for instance, these results cannot be, I mean, for these masses of the scalar field, they cannot be extrapolated to, to larger to larger uh, masses, right? Because you, you, well, we, that you were just, tra you did just this toy test to the, on, up to the computational power. But, I mean, with these results, you cannot, like, extrapolate to, to of further. Of course, you, you cannot extrapolate directly, you cannot say, this is, we have this and we have like uh, um, a series or a list. This is not a dark pattern, really. But if we are able to, to keep uh, a scalar field that survives for cosmological times, but we see that decreasing the mass these times began to, to become larger and larger. We can think that if we reduce the mass till, till, uh, till a realistic value, but the expected value, we are going to, uh, to find the same, the same kind of, of behavior. So you expect to, to I mean, to, uh, with more, with a, with a, like, uh, better, well, with larger computation and power, achieve those those yeah, uh, scenarios. Oh, I mean, okay. yeah, because I don't know, to characterize this kind of masses, we need like about ten to, to four. But for for these these uh, oscillating frequencies, we need ten to ten. In order to really characterize and have, because for instance, for one of these models, what was more or less the, the computational uh, time, computational time and well, like resources? Maybe six days of computational with four with OpenMP and four processors. So we have evolved like twenty-five. So it's really yeah. we are now uh, working with. The case where we initially we don't have an, an a black hole, but we have a an star that is collapsing to a black hole to see if after the collapse the this car field is able to survive to, to the, this catastrophic event and form these quasi bound bound states. It, it seems to be so, but we have about like 60, 60 Results that you can do something with uh, rotational flux. There are studies of uh, fully nonlinear, the fully nonlinear regime with self-gravitating scalar field, but in 3D or even in contact symmetry, it's also very difficult.
think that the next week there's another symbol. So we would, I hope to see you again.